welcome you to the Adaptive Leadership Colloquium and thank you for coming today. And uh, I just wanna, we'll obviously have a chance to say more, but just give a shout out to our Adaptive Leadership Fellows who are also getting ready for graduation very soon. Um, so I wanna give you, I'm Linda LaSalle Bryant. Um, I'm clinical associate professor here. Um, and uh, with the rest of my portfolio, I am um, working together with my partner, Mark Mashal, who I'll introduce in a minute, to bring more leadership education to social workers. Um, my, my dream is to see it educated uh, to see it integrated really fully into social work education. Um, and the reason for that is, as you know, we are a profession of problem solvers, um, and we are a profession that deals with some of society's most difficult, complex, and intractable problems. Um, and so if ever there was a profession that needed innovation, if ever there was a profession that needed leadership um, to make progress on these difficult issues, it's ours. Um, and I want to make sure that as social workers, we're as equipped and capacitated as possible um, to make meaningful progress on those issues. So a little bit about how this initiative got started. Um, before I joined the faculty of NYU Silver, I was the executive director of a child welfare nonprofit named Inwood House. Um, we worked with uh, young women who were in foster care or runaway or homeless or involved in the juvenile justice system and who were pregnant or parenting. Right, a real complicated set of circumstances. And as you know, in terms of child welfare, it's some of the most difficult work because there are lots of systemic and bureaucratic hurdles that have to be navigated. Um, and as an executive director, I was struggling with how to support my team to be able to do their best work. And uh, one of my funders, who is also the funder who underwrites this initiative, um, actually did something that most funders don't do. She asked, what is it that keeps you up at night? How can I, as a funder, support the things that you care about, but more importantly, the things that are really challenging you? And I talked about, this was during the um, economic crash of 2008, and I talked about how difficult it was to help my team metabolize how much change, how much rapid change was happening. They could, we could barely keep up, we'd adjust to one thing and then something else was coming. And um, she helped fund uh, an effort for us to bring adaptive leadership into our organization. And that's where I got to meet Mark. Mark was the expert in adaptive leadership who came to our agency, trained me, trained members of my team, and eventually we got to train the whole staff on this. And I had the experience of having a whole new lens with which to look at our challenges um, and with which to open up possibilities. So when I came here to NYU Silver, um, I, re I recognized how my own training as a social worker came with like absolutely zilch in leadership. Um, and I also then was looking at the statistics of how few social workers are assuming the leadership ranks of our human services agencies, and that was really of concern to me. Why were we not occupying the leadership ranks of our own profession? Um, and so, um, together with Mark, we worked to bring adaptive leadership here to NYU Silver with the hope that we would be able to integrate leadership concepts into the graduate school curriculum. We know that there are plenty of postgraduate programs, including one that we run right here at NYU Silver, but not enough in terms of the actual in-school, in-class curriculum. So uh, four years ago, we began um, with a small grant from our funder, pushing in some of the adaptive leadership concepts into the two practice three macro-oriented courses. From there, we created the fellowship program where every spring we would um, have an application process for second year MSW students to become fellows. And what they do is they come and get additional training on the weekends, once a month, throughout the spring semester, um, where they're able to get deeper knowledge on adaptive leadership concepts and then apply it to challenges within their field practice, within their field placement settings. Um, and so this is the fourth cohort of 
fellows that we are graduating. We're really delighted about that. And now, with those four cohorts, we, what we basically have is a network of adaptive leadership practitioners that we hope will also influence the field. And we know from our alum that that is actually happening. Um, most recently, we were awarded a grant from the New York Community Trust to expand the work that we've been doing here to another social work school. And we are in preliminary talks right now with other schools of social work to see who we will partner with to replicate or adapt the work there. Um, so I'd like to turn it over now to Mark Manischel, my colleague, um, who will talk to you a little bit more about adaptive leadership. So I'd like to start by going back to one of the first ideas we talked about in our seminars and in our classes. And that is the idea of distinguishing leadership and authority. Uh, in our class, we, we try to decouple the ideas. And those of you who are not familiar with this distinction that we're making between leadership and authority, we're trying to separate the idea of authority, which is more about your role or your position or your power that you have, either formally or informally, to provide protection, direction, and order. And some of the, some of the fellows will be talking about that today. So that's, we think about authority, and then we distinguish leadership as an activity. And because we think of leadership as an activity, then anyone can exercise it, regardless of where you sit on the formal authority hierarchy. So we think about leadership as an activity, uh, but I want to add something to that because I've been thinking over the last 24 hours and um, the last weeks and months about this concept. And I think that it is about leadership as an activity, but I think leadership is also a choice. So we could you're all about to go, fellow, I'm speaking to fellows here, but I'm speaking to myself and to all of you here. You all can occupy positions and do your jobs, get your paychecks, operate within your scope of authority uh, that people grant to you. Uh, you may even do well in your careers and ascend up the authority hierarchy and have a good uh, professional life. Um, and nothing wrong with that, right? That, that's fine. Um, and, and I wanna say and rather than or, um, because I don't think it's a choice between authority and leadership. I think you can do both. We could have <laughs> debates about that. But I would say and you can exercise leadership you can be a change maker. You can push up against the boundaries of the authorization that you have been given to make change on something that you care enough about that you want to change it. You want to make your organization better. You want to improve the system of which you're a part. You want to improve your country and, and the world. But I would say that that's a choice. One of my mentors, uh, Dean Williams, put it this way, he said, um, we have these leadership moments that present to us uh, all the time, right? And actually, you know, you were here when he said that. Um, are we gonna take them or are we not? That's, that's our choice. We can either stay in our lane, do what it is that people are asking us to do, or we can be change makers. We can tr help transform the systems of which we're a part to make them better. And our clients, and I would say our communities and the world is counting on us. Because if, if we don't do it as social workers, like who's gonna do it, you know? But, it, but it's, our, it's our choice, right? So I guess we also have to acknowledge that at the same time, it's risky, you know? It's not easy, it's going to be hard to exercise leadership if we choose to do that. And then one of the things that came out in our seminar 
So I think it's been a theme throughout our fellowship, but I think in general is that it's going to take time. Adaptive change takes time, and we're not going to see the results of that at the end of the semester. You know, a fellowship, we're not going to see that at the end of a year. We may not even see it several years. We may not even see some of the change or the progress that we are a part of, even in our lifetimes. But are we still willing to do it anyway? Is there a greater purpose or calling uh, of which we want to be a part of? And so I hope that this fellowship and this process and this work that we're doing here will at least in some small way increase the likelihood that you will choose leadership, um, regardless of how hard it is. And uh, so I want to thank all the fellows for um, allowing me to be part of that learning process with you. Uh, so I'd like to uh, now invite uh, Eric Yazdani. Um, so we have a couple of TAs, and Asiya, uh, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> your, your timing is impeccable. She got caught on the subway. Um, so Eric and Asiya have been um, working with us uh, very closely. So we consider ourselves like a, a full teaching team, and they have been involved in all the planning, all the hard work of, of delivering this program. So I'm grateful to you both. And uh, I want to invite you, Eric, you want to start? Sure. Yeah. So. OK. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, so I just, um, I'll keep my comments pretty short, um, but I just want to say two main things. Um, and first, just all to all the fellows, um, just how much I've enjoyed uh, working with you. It's been um, brief, but I really um, have so much appreciated the way in which you've engaged with some hard questions and um, difficult concepts, um, and just some vulnerable learning experiences, because this um, work is not always easy. Um, and part of the reason I do it is because of just how much I learned from working with um, with you all. Um, there are different reasons I do it, but that's, that's a very big one. So um, I just wanted to say that. And you all have had a really nice energy um, and spirit from the, the first session. Um, so I really appreciated that. Um, and just building on a little bit of what uh, Linda and Mark um, were talking about, um, the other thing I wanted to say is, and it goes a little bit to what Mark um, was talking about with the fact that we have a choice. Um, so I was first exposed to this model uh, a while ago at the, the Kennedy School, um, 2004. Um, and I've sort of gone a little bit back and forth between engaging with it um, and then doing some other things in my life and coming back to it. Um, and I was thinking about that in, um, particularly in the context of the fact that um, you all are graduating and looking at jobs um, and going forward. And the other day, the, the teaching team um, was talking about the, the question of sort of what do we do um, in our lives? You know, what jobs do we choose? Um, and then the other question of why we do it. Um, and I think the why we do it gets to um, the question of purpose and to Mark's um, idea about the, the choices that we make, um, that we have um, purposes in our lives, that if we can stay true and really hold on to our sense of purpose um, and the deep and often very personal reasons that that purpose exists, um, that it really can provide a longer term guide. You know, because we can get pretty lost in career choices and finding a job, taking care of ourselves, you know, making an income. There are all these pressures, particularly on social workers, because um, of course, you know, we're not the highest paid profession. Um, and that takes, sometimes can put pressures that take our eye off the ball. And so I think it's really important to keep um, in mind the purpose you have inside, because it's a great way to keep your eye on the ball. And what's really most important to you when that's not always easy. Um, so just uh, so you can keep, keep that in mind. But again, it's been such a pleasure uh, working with all the fellows um, and being part of this more broadly at NYU. So thanks. Well, I wasn't expecting to really say much today, but um, no, I, I just, just to piggyback on what Eric mentioned, I came to this work as a student and then as a fellow, and then I was kind of like, over the summer, they asked me to come and ask to be a part of the teaching team. And it's really been such a rich experience. Um, 
it seems like when we go into social work, we think about all the major changes that we want to make, but we don't really have the tools on how to make them. And we don't really know, like, what's the framework that I can really use when you're thinking about systematic changes. And so for me, I saw a lot of parallel between this framework and what we've learned also from a clinical perspective as well. And so I just, I don't know, I just think that um, it's been a powerful framework um, back to like meaning and purpose and knowing your why, um, what motivates you. And I think what's so attractive about this framework is that it's consistent with the values of social work. It's consistent with social uh, social justice. It's consistent with wanting to like put a premium on enhancing social relationships. Like there's so many things that it's consistent literally for social workers. So I just want to thank you for you know this experience. I feel like I've learned a lot from you as well. Obviously, this is the first teaching experience for me, um, and I'm hoping that you know we'll continue to grow in numbers, and this will be like a really huge um, network. So thank you. So I want to encourage um, the fellows, but actually everyone in the room, as you begin your, I think you're already engaged in job hunting and interviewing, and you get a job description or you hear a job description, I want you to picture putting that job description on one column. But in the other column, I want you to have the invisible job description, right? Which is really your, your purpose statement. And think about, in addition to, you know, seeing so many clients or conducting so many psychosocials, what is it, what's the change you're really hoping to be able to make? And always keep that purpose description alongside your job description. Um, and don't confuse both of them, right? Um, one is the role you're authorized to do, and the other is the change that you want to be able to make. And that's where your leadership opportunities are going to come. Um, so now we want to give the fellows an opportunity to just share with you what they've learned, what they've called, what wisdom they've, they've taken from this experience. Um, and I want you to know that we don't know what they're going to say. Um, so this is a risk, right? Every year we take this risk, it's like, okay, we call the names. We don't know what they're going to say. Um, but but that's, that's part of the process and that's part of the trust. So, I am going to ask um, Heidi Alonso to come up. Woo! Um, hi, good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. Um, so throughout this experience, I definitely took a lot with me, more than I probably expected. Um, my placement is with Interboro Developmental and Counseling Center, which is an agency that offers um, satellite clinics within high schools and middle schools. And as a whole setting, sometimes you're kind of siloed and you're not really incorporated into the school and really seeing changes. Um, so one of my thoughts was how to increase our usefulness in the schools and how to better ourselves as social workers. And as one of our duties um, for social justice and improving uh, conditions, I, I found this model very helpful in changing how perspectives are looked at, and particularly using um, the concept of building allies, I found that to be the most helpful because um, there truly is power in numbers. And when doing this and moving forward, I realized, especially as an intern, it probably wasn't the easiest thing. So finding uh, allies that are more aware of this uh, system, more experienced, or have different perspectives, really helps you create a more critical analysis when diagnosing the system, um, when thinking of critical changes that you can make that aren't just putting a band-aid on the situation. Um, so, um, using this framework, I have really learned to take a, a step back and kind of analyze everything from a different lens, incorporating other people and learning, you know, sometimes it's okay to not find the finished product, 
I know that even just shaking up the system a little bit can be some level of progress in that responsibility of social justice. Thank you. Gabrielle? Gabrielle Austin. Um, so I also found this to be incredibly valuable, not just in my placement, but also my work, because I work full time also. <laughs> and one of the, um, the themes was evaluating all the different stakeholders before you can even think about um, properly putting any kind of solution or intervention on a challenge. And what that means is even when you're frustrated that things aren't moving fast enough and that people aren't mobilizing to make that change, that you can sit there and actually um, acknowledge that every different faction, every group of people, every single person has different values, different loyalties, and different potential losses if this change occurs. So realizing and taking the time to acknowledge that and knowing that we're all bright and shiny and new and really excited to make change. Um, we're encountering people who are in their careers and not really ready to make those changes. And the best way to mobilize people is to know what their purpose is also and where their, their values lie and what their potential losses are so that we can make the change as appealable to them as possible. And I just want to thank Mark and Linda and Asiya and Eric because this was a really incredible experience. And I'm really grateful because my bachelor's is in business, so I had a business lens going into this. And it really changed my perspective on how to approach challenges in a way that's meaningful. So thank you. <laughs> wanted to get my master's of social work degree and at that nonprofit, whenever something went wrong, you just developed a protocol, right? Like you just added a protocol and then followed it. And then at my placement this year, there was a lot of, we're gonna add a protocol and it's gonna work for a week and then we're not gonna do it anymore. So what, that's the technical solution is like adding a protocol, but the adaptive solution is really looking at the culture and the base of what the issue is and then figuring that out and changing that. So not necessarily adding a protocol, but going to what the core and the root of the issue really is. And I think that can be seen when working with our clients too. A technical solution is like a law or a policy, but is that really helping? For some of our clients, it's not. Um, but yeah, just thank you so much for this opportunity. I've learned so much. And that's it. Mary Burns. So I actually had the pleasure of uh, taking the exercising leadership class before the fellowship. Um, and honestly, when I first enrolled, I imagined that it was going to be a class where I would sit down and learn management 101, how to lead a nonprofit, how to graduate and figure out, you know, make my way in the macro world. Um, that is not what that class was about. <laughs> really, it was so much more than that, giving anybody the skills that they need in order to affect change. Um, I do want to formally thank Mark for stealing everything I wanted to say before. Really, one of the concepts that drew me to this framework and that keeps me invested in it is this distinguishing authority and leadership. 
like I said, when I was walking into that classroom, I thought that I was going to get a script for how to be a good manager, thinking that leadership was about the positions that you held and that I couldn't actually affect change unless I got to the highest level of the rung. And, you know, as an intern, that made me feel like I didn't have a lot of power. But what this framework taught me is that anybody has the ability to exercise leadership because leadership isn't about your position. It's about it's about taking the steps and performing an action to affect change. And like Mark said, a lot of the time it's messy, it's dangerous, and it's risky because that's what leadership is about. It's about making change even when people aren't ready for that change to be made. So I think that that stands to do a lot for the social work profession because we are facing a, a, a challenge as we walk out of this, like, out of this hallowed halls of NYU, not knowing what we're going to face, especially in terms of our own professional development. So I think that having these skills and realizing that we all are capable of leadership was really, really important to me. And I'm re just really happy that NYU is becoming a big leader in actually exercising leadership in social work education, because I feel this has been such, something that's really been absent, it was absent from my first year that I'm really lucky I had the opportunity to be a part of. So thank you all so much for this opportunity, and thank you. resonated with me and that was acknowledging the loyalties within a larger nonprofit that may not um, be led by social workers and is led by um, people with, a, with a, a professional history in uh, law or um, psychology and something that was um, a little bit difficult for me to understand and for me to digest was um, how to assert leadership um, when the authority that's given to you is very social work specific, although you are in a larger um, organization. Um, and I, I think that when we, in working in a larger, not a larger um, a public policy organization as a social worker, um, it's important to balance the loyalty of, um, the loyalty to self versus the loyalty of the mission of the organization. And that was just something that was very difficult for me personally. Um, when um, interpreting the, the different relationships within the office. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, I just wanted to um, thank the teaching team so much um, for everything. And I'm still kind of grappling with the, how the relationships within the, within the office affected um, my learning experience. And I think that it was in a phenomenal way because I got was able to learn from so many different um, professional fields. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Jessica Lewis. Hi. Um, so as Dr. Bryant said, we are problem solvers as social workers, and even more so I think we're really caring and compassionate problem solvers. And when I think about this leadership model, I think about the very values um, of social work, and I think this model really speaks to everything that social workers are. I think the first day when we differentiated authority from leadership, that within itself was so beneficial to me as a reminder, as many people said, that anyone can exercise leadership, and that it's about the person and the passion, and not just about the position, and about the willingness to step up <coughs> and put yourself out there, even when you don't know the exact outcome. Um, I thought a lot about my internship, but also my job before starting here as a case planner in foster care and the many challenges that we saw all the time through that work. And thinking back to who I was then and that I didn't believe that I had the position or even like the knowledge to step up and exercise leadership. So I think moving forward, this will change the way that I think. Um, and I think that people make a lot of assumptions about social workers and by engaging more courageously, and by engaging in leadership, we can change the story going to the other. Thank you. Chris Longo. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris. Um, I had the privilege of serving as a United Nations representative for my second year placement. And I mentioned this because the entire process was an adaptive leadership challenge. <laughs> um, navigating such a lofty institution was quite an experience when considering 
the prestige of the situation and also the challenges I was experiencing in the office. Um, I had a supervisor who wrung his hands quite a bit and was very content letting problematic continuity occur while also railing against the system and calling for these changes. So a lot of the things that I was learning in this fellowship were reflected in that office and also right here in the halls of NYU. I don't want to step too much on my following presenters who are all presenting right after me who may be talking about similar concepts, um, but I'm part of a student group doing a lot of the work here for navigating social change. And it's quite a challenge to navigate such, so many, 50 roughly faculty voters and navigating the ideas here has been an adaptive challenge as well. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as a reflection of the fact that everything that we've learned in this fellowship reflects regularly in our daily lives. And I also want to acknowledge that similar to Mary and Mark, uh, Dr. Bryant touched a lot on what I was going to talk about <laughs> with our profession, um, not occupying leadership roles, despite the fact that we're trained train to solve these problems and the dichotomies that we experience there. And again, I just wanted to thank all four of you for your roles and your time. the B. Robert Williamson Jr. Foundation um, just for creating this hub of leadership at NYU Silver and also all of my fellow fellows um, for being part of this with us or with me. Um, part of the adaptive leadership framework is to understand that it's a constant process where we're evaluating and reevaluating and doing what needs to be addressed and accomplished to make significant changes. And one of the things that I really learned, and I feel like Mark brushed us on a lot, is that we're going to make mistakes and it's going to be confusing and we're not going to get it right. Um, and it's only a semester long, so we're not able to do the things that we want to do um, in just that short amount of time and see tangible solutions. But I think that's also reflective of adaptive leadership as a whole. It's adaptive, it's not technical, it's not a checklist. And that's something that I've really been struggling with a lot is I like tasks and I like to be able to say like, oh, I did this and I did this and I did this and now I'm done and now it's five and I can go home. Um, but that's not what this semester has been about. Um, so one of the concepts that I chose to focus on was living in the disequilibrium. disequilibrium. Um, and that's largely based on like the emotions that we have and what we can handle. And so when performing adaptive leadership, one of the things that you struggle with a lot is all of the emotions and all of the goals and all of the discomfort of people around you as well as yourself. Um, so unlike technical solutions, like I said before, where you're checking things off, this is more of like an emotional, more of a community change that requires a lot of in-depth reflection and a lot of in-depth um, solutions. Um, so what I did for this is kind of reevaluate the stakeholders, as Gabrielle said. I think it was Gabrielle. Or was <laughs> Um, it's okay. Um, <laughs> um, but reevaluating the stakeholders and really figuring out what I gain to lose or stand to gain and lose and what they stand to gain and lose. And really being at the brink of that and what you can tolerate is how you push momentum through and how you kind of um, realize where you can get to. And once you hit that, um, you really like one of the examples that give is raising the heat. Um, and I think someone else is talking about that a little bit later. Um, but it's like when you're cooking something, you want to get it hot to have things go through, but you don't want it to burn. You want to make sure that you're not burning out. And so that's something that I've really tried to reflect on a lot. Um, so while we feel eager to, to commit to change, we also have to measure that loss. Um, so as a student, um, I stand to lose grades, reputation, money, friendships, a host of other things, but also gain equity, a new rep reputation, friendships, educational and professional growth. And I feel like this fellowship has really um, leaned into that and made me realize that it's the positives and the negatives and how they interact with each other and how we interact as a community.
expecting something of all of you. I want you to think, just reflect on what your purpose is. So if you were to think about what you were put on earth to do, just like a basic question, really simple. <laughs> what brings you joy and meaning? So I just want to give everyone like 15 seconds or so to just, just percolate on that for a little bit. All right, so I'm sure whatever you thought about will keep, uh, keep moving around in your brain throughout the day and it might require more reflection, but I think it's important as we talk about sort of purpose versus task and this idea of our purpose being something much deeper, kind of Merrill alluded to and as the teaching team alluded to, and thinking about what that purpose actually is, because it can be really hard to identify that. So thinking about using ourself as data, and that's something that I thought was really interesting about this model, that it gets really personal and is, as Eric said, vulnerable. And thinking about that, for me, I was thinking a lot about the adaptive challenge I chose two, but the ones that I focused on, and one was at my field placement, which was an interdisciplinary team where it was a hospital setting, and so there's psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nurses. And so when I was thinking about my own challenge and how I would frame it, it was also really important to think about like what assumptions I had that were underlying that. And some of them come from my background as a social worker. Some of them come from my upbringing and from my family and from my community. Like what do I think it means to be a social worker? Like what's the value of like what, what, how does your role defined by gender and race? Like what is the biopsychosocial model? Like all these things are coming into my existence in the workplace and my, my idea of like conceptualizing my adaptive challenge. And I think it was really interesting using this framework to then also think what assumptions are underlying mine and then also what might my boss's version be of this adaptive challenge or what might a coworkers or a subordinate or a client even or someone who would think that my intervention is a bad idea. Like what are they thinking? What, what assumptions are underlying that? So by using myself as data, I can also think about the assumptions of other stakeholders in the model. And as a clinician in training, I really appreciated that really personal piece because a lot of the students in this, in this cohort were really interested in macro practice and, and I'm really interested in micro practice and working with people. So being able to bring in that perspective and see how seamlessly that could be integrated into the model too was something that was really valuable for me coming in. So thinking about my own values, my own loyalties, what I stood to lose as a stakeholder within the system. So thank you to everyone here, and thank you to the teaching team, and uh, take care. How's everyone feeling? Everyone's okay? Good? It's not blue, not too stuffy? All good? Okay, good. So, um, I often think of this, but uh, when I came to social work school, I thought I was going to learn three things, which was I was going to learn how to use big words, <laughs> uh, I was going to learn how to shut things down, and I was going to call everyone out on everything they did wrong. Um, and I was coming from two years of a lot of personal turmoil after my undergraduate degree, and I'd had a marketing executive position, and I was very young for it. And I was pretty much driven to resign from that because I was forced to become very acutely aware of my presence as a very young and attractive and intelligent woman in a very male-driven tourism industry. Um, and I wish I had this framework back then because I wouldn't have made the choices that I made in leaving that job. I would have probably left it, yes, but I would have made different choices in how I did that. Um, and reflecting on the framework that I've learned in this fellowship, one of the things that really stuck out for me was to act politically because um, I had to confront with it face to face as I worked through the challenge that I was focusing on, um, which was to work with the things that have happened at this school. Um, I don't like politics personally, um, but I'm still like I'm a big fan of embarrassing people, or as we would call it, character assassination in adaptive <laughs> leadership, uh, because it feels very instinctual. It it brings out a volatility that I have that I've worked very hard to keep dormant, and it just it feels very satisfying. But acting politically really stuck with me because I had to take a hard look at myself and see where my urge to solve things came from and to also slow down 
Um, and it also meant taking stock of the things that I had in my hands to change things, but also to see a system that was not going to give me enough power to do the things that I wanted to and to analyze how it was set up against me. Um, it was really weighing like how much I could hold. And then following that, it was about evaluating people that were above me, that had more power than I did, and to see how I could make myself like a space to sit in those rooms and have those conversations with people that would probably not let me in. Um, I had to be sneaky. It was uncomfortable. And politics is uncomfortable. I mean, it always is. It's about image and you never want your image to be tarnished. But it, I think it's one of the best strategies we have if we use it well because being political flies in the face of being vulnerable and it silos people and it separates people into factions but it's also something that we have to look and analyze so that we know how to work it um and at the end of it when you think about it in politics everybody has some, something to lose so there's always something to leverage when there's something to lose um and acting politically has really helped me analyze what it is that people are afraid of losing and to understand those losses very deeply and find also what it is that I risk losing and how it relates to those that I don't meet eye to eye with and also then cutting a deal or to establish an agreement on what can be achieved mutually because that's really where we have to go with things. Um, and if I had to compare adaptive leadership to a metaphor, I would say it's it's really like a dance. It's like finding the moments where like you find like your dancing troupe to like breathe together because they're dancing too fast. You find ways to make the troops support each other when they're performing. And you have to kind of help them see how they move with the tempo, but also how they coordinate when there is no music to dance to and how they breathe through it together. Um, it's painstaking. It asks for a lot of patience. It asks for a lot of endurance, and it also asks for a spirit that can take a beating sometimes. It's very, very hard work, but it's always worth it to do it. Um, I'm really grateful and honored that I was considered for this fellowship. I'm very indebted to the learning I've received here. Thank you, Moaz, Linda, Eric, Athea, my comrades. Um, and I'm going to take this everywhere I go. So thank you. Martha Pereira. Hello. Um, my name is Martha. So I got interested in Narcos uh, when I took Dr. Brian's uh, practice class last year. Um, I got interested into like learning more leadership roles or just being like in the organization. Um, so I was at a hospital during this uh, last year and I thought to myself like, oh, I'm just there to do like clinical work, like nothing, like I'm not gonna do any change, like I'm just gonna go with the flow. Um, and after being in the adaptive leadership um, fellowship, um, I learned that it's not just that, like we could do more than just our regular like jobs or like our titles. Of course, it's a choice, not everybody needs to do it or has to do it. Um, but I thought it was really important and having this um, leadership, uh, this adaptive leadership helped me um, navigate through that and it helped me um, learn different things that I will take on um, through everywhere that I go, every job that I see. And um, thanks to this fellowship, I am looking into like more like uh, macro work, um, coming into the career that was just more clinical. Um, just focusing on that, but then I realized that there's more um, change in that, and something that did resonate with me more was um, the turning up the heat. So everybody, I learned, um, everybody at my field placement obviously doesn't have the same priorities, has the same goals that I do, and wanted to do the same change that I did. But I did have to motivate everybody differently and try to get everybody on the same page. Like Krush said, it is tiring and it's time consuming. Um, but I think it is worth it because at the end of the day, it's not just for myself, for the agency, but it is um, for the clients as well. Um, and I just want to thank, 
thank Mark and the SDNR for everything. Thank you. concept would be uh, I chose to sketch on the balcony. I find that for um, little small concepts under this, it's very important for the graphic work. Um, first is observe what is going on and to um, develop uh, more than one interpretation because we never know what's going to happen um, with all the stakeholders um, and to work for partners and uh, con continuously go back to the balcony and to uh, re-evaluate the situation. And the third would be to um, stay diagnostic while taking all the actions you are doing. Um, second, the uh, final one would be uh, read yourself um, to see um, your strengths and ways of improvement. I, uh, my personal goal in future would be to go back to China and work with the infrastructure building for the uh, senior care uh, industry because it's something we lack at the moment and it's, um, in, uh, it's increasing of the senior population that I think is critical um, to use this framework uh, in the work I want to do in the future. Um, I want to finally thank you for the speaking team to give me a great opportunity to uh, practice this uh, leadership. Richard Wenton. Hello, all. Um, first, I want to say, Prouche, dance metaphor, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I do talk briefly about dance, but not um, that way. So, um, great. Uh, hi, I'm Richard. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the idea of diagnosing the system through the adaptive leadership framework. Uh, this past year, my internship was at AERP New York doing our LGBT community engagement, which was something that not a lot of people knew, like raise your hand if you knew AERP had a name thing, LGBT, right? No one's ever heard those two acronyms in the same sentence before. Um, so it's been an amazing uh, year, especially building up to the summer of Stonewall 50 and, and uh, World Pride and all of that stuff. So uh, applying this framework and specifically diagnosing the system in such a massive organization where there's so much going on was really uh, beneficial. So I'm gonna dig a little bit more into that. It required multiple as uh, aspects of the adaptive leadership uh, framework, which people have kind of already touched on, um, but namely, I think it, uh, getting on the balcony and being able to assess your organization, the overall system um, from a third person or outside point of view. Um, I like to think of it as if you are a biologist kind of looking at an organism all on its own. Um, you assess the system's inherent strengths, its weaknesses, um, how it compensates, uh, and what functions produce its current homeostasis, and how all of that relates to the adaptive challenge that you are seeking. Um, you must also delve into what drives each stakeholder, which was also uh, touched on, going, um, gaining an awareness of what they have to gain and lose through this process. Um, and with this, you can diagnose the adaptive challenge with a more holistic lens of your organization. The strengths can be capitalized on, uh, the weaknesses may represent where the work needs to be done, where compensation is happening probably represents shortcomings. Uh, and looking at the homeostasis and being aware that disrupting homeostasis will always be fought against both in biology and in adaptive leadership. Um, and also being aware that what drives the involved stakeholders will shape the way an adaptive challenge will be approached and what adaptive solution may be employed or actually function in that organization. Um, so I worked as a professional dancer uh, before I came to MSW school and why the diagnosing the system uh, idea I guess resonated with me so much is that it's very similar to the way that we approach our bodies in dance. So we study kinesiology and we, we talk about what you know, our alignment is what we were born with, what our inherent strengths are, usually conversely what we are not as good at and what requires a little bit more work. Um, and so having that, you know, and, and specifically the idea of compensation. We, our bodies take over in so many ways when we're not naturally good at something, your body will find a way to do it, um, but it might not be the most efficient or the healthiest way to get that done. Uh, and so I think that that is kind of transferable to me. And then I think specifically with us here, soon to be MSWs entering the world, it, we also have a lot of transferable skills from the rest of our education that we've kind of gathered here. Uh, specifically that we 
uh, are trained with a diagnostic perceptivity that can be applied across the macro-micro spectrum, both with clients and in organizations of various sizes. Um, and that can elevate the adaptive leadership work that we can do in the myriad vital organizations that we will eventually join. And so I want to say thank you to the entire PCC for this opportunity and my fellows, and congratulations on graduating. Mm -hmm.